Thank you. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. has jetted off on another international trip. No airport lineups for him, and I bet we're going to see some more pictures of him with his mask off having a great time. He flaunts the personal freedoms he's enjoying abroad, while back here Canadians are suffering under his out-of-date restrictions. Tourism, federal employees, small businesses, families, all are suffering. They're all pawns in the Prime Minister's COVID game. Isn't it true the Prime Minister knows he needs to lift these restrictions, but he would rather do COVID theatre than do what's right? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And from the beginning of this pandemic, we've been there for Canadians. And of course, it's the Prime Minister's job and obligation to travel to other countries to do his important work. But when we hear the opposition speak positively about public health measures, but badly about vaccination, it confuses the public. We should be encouraging our neighbours to consider a third or a fourth dose. We cannot have relaxed public health measures and more freedom without vaccination as COVID-19 continues to progress. But we all have an obligation to ensure that our neighbours are aware of the opportunity for a third dose. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Canadians would like to be planning their summer vacation right now, but too many are focused on how they're going to be able to afford fuel for their cars or feed their families. Over 20% of Canadians are actually skipping a meal in order to save money. The Liberal solution? Blame. Blame COVID. Blame Putin. Blame Conservatives. Well, today our Conservative Caucus motion provides real solutions so Canadians can take that summer trip, send their kids to camp, and not worry about missing a flight. Will the Liberals support giving Canadians a break, or are they going to double down on that vindictive, petty approach? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, we absolutely understand that affordability matters for Canadians. And that's why we are taking action, by increasing the Canada Workers' Benefit. This year, a family of three is getting $2,300 more. By increasing the OAS for seniors 75 and over by 10% this year, Mr. Speaker. And with a $500 top-up, Mr. Speaker, for people facing housing affordability challenges. Leader of the Opposition. It's great. A few piddly checks that might dribble in through the mail. And this government thinks that that has having any impact on what Canadians are dealing with. 30, I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, 38% of Canadians are worried more about money than anything else that they're dealing with. So these Liberal checks that are coming from the pockets of Canadians because their taxes are going up are doing absolutely nothing. But these Liberals are so massively right. out of touch. They don't understand gas prices. They don't understand high food prices. They don't understand long lineups. They understand nothing about what Canadians are dealing with, and they don't care. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what is out of touch. What is out of touch is for someone who lives in government accommodation to suggest that a check for $2,300 for a family of three working at the minimum wage is piddly. It is out of touch to suggest that for a senior over 75 to get an additional $815 is piddly. This is real support for the Canadians who need it most. Okay, we'll continue. The Honourable Member from Mégantic-Lérable. Since the crisis, we've realized that the Minister of Finance is completely deconnected from the reality of Canadians. Gas prices aren't too high for her. It's the fault of Russia, the pandemic, and even Canadians. And today, they reproach the Conservatives pr proposing a motion to ask them to take action to give help to all Canadians who are having a hard time paying their bills at the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. We want to help Canadians, but are they going to continue their vindicative games that are giving a hard time? 
for two Canadians. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives like to quote reports from the Parliamentary Budget Officer. So today I will quote the PBO, who today spoke about inflation. And here's what he said. The resurgence of high inflation can be attributed to COVID-19 more recently and to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This drove up inflationary pressure. That is it, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mécontique-Lérable, Mr. Speaker, for a Canadian worker, for any Canadian, the reason behind this inflation and why everything costs more is not what matters. It's what, what matters is they can pay food at the end of the month. They want to be able to allow all their children to eat enough at the end of the month. They want to be able to go to work and to pay for the gas to get there. Whether it's the pandemic or COVID behind this, or any other reason, the Liberals say, what matters to them is they need help right now. Why are they so disconnected from the reality of Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, that's simply not true. The reality is that we take, we understand full well that affordability is very important for Canadian families. And that's exactly why we took measures such as increasing the Canada Workers' Benefit, which will give a loan worker of $1,000 or more. We're looking at another $500 for people who are having a hard time finding housing. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, Quebecers are furious about the delays in obtaining their passports. Even in the middle of a crisis, there's no passport office open on weekends, even for people who have to leave the country within 48 hours. Imagine they force people who have been waiting for three months to miss a day of work to apply for emergency passport. And even worse, they charge $50 to $100 in additional fees. It's crazy. They're making citizens pay the price for their incompetence. Will they open offices on weekends and process urgent requests without charge? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, as I've already said in this chamber, we have seen an unprecedented increase in demands for passports, but people still shouldn't be charged for an urgent request if it's outside of service days. And also, there are some dozen offices that are open almost every Saturday, so they, we can meet the urgent demand. Thank you. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, they're saying they're doing everything they can, as long as it's 8 to 4 and at the citizens' expense. This is indecent. They need to open their offices on weekends for people who have to travel within 48 hours. They need to abolish the extra fees for people who have applied and are still waiting past the 20 days. When will they actually do everything they can to make up for their mistakes and deliver the passports on time and without charge? This is enough. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've already said, these fees should not be charged if the passport is uh, within 20 days. I'll re re reiterate that. I know that workers at Service Canada are working very hard. They're working evenings and weekends so that they can serve Canadians and they are there and we're going to do everything we can to make sure Canadians do receive their pa passports before they travel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One out of every four Canadian in this country is going hungry because they cannot afford their groceries. At the same time, corporations are making record profits. They're breaking record after record. Our plan is to tax the excess. <laughs> I'm going to ask the Honourable Member to start from the top so that we can all hear his question. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. I just mentioned that Canadians are hungry, and I hear laughter in the chambers. Yeah. They should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. Yeah.
for their groceries, while corporations are making record profits and are responsible for one-fourth of the inflation that Canadians are experiencing. Our plan is to tax the excess profits of these corporations and put the money directly into the pockets of Canadians who need it. When will this government stop protecting the wealth of these corporations and start standing up for families who need help right now? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to being sure everyone in Canada pays their fair share. And we have taken concrete action, Mr. Speaker. We have permanently raised the corporate income tax on the largest and most profitable banks and insurance companies in Canada by 1.5%. We are introducing a Canada recovery dividend on banks and insurance companies of 15%. And Mr. Speaker, we are putting in place a luxury tax on cars and planes worth more than $100,000 and boats worth more than $250,000. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. We need to expand that tax that's been proposed for banks onto the profitable oil and gas sector, corporate big box stores who are making record profits while Canadians are hungry and can't afford their food. Un quart de Canadien. One fourth of Canadians are going hungry because they cannot afford groceries. At the same time, corporate, corporations are making record profits. Our plan is to tax excess profits, and we need to redistribute these profits right back to the pockets of Canadians. When will this government protect the interests of families rather than protecting the profits of big corporations? Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, our commitment has made a commitment to having everyone pay their fair share of taxes, and we have taken concrete measures, such as permanently increasing the corporate income tax rate for banks and insurance companies that are the most profitable, and by introducing a 15 per cent Canada recovery dividend on banks and insurance companies. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, almost every G7 country has a plan to deal with high gas prices and runaway inflation. For example, Germany has a $16 billion plan to lower gas prices. The Americans have released their strategic reserve. Even the British government has cut gas taxes and are considering more. From our Prime Minister, a word salad. Besides blaming Putin or suggesting people to buy an electric vehicle, can the Prime Minister cobble together a plan to deal with rising gas prices, or is that just way too much to ask of him as a leader of a G7 country? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, the party that needs a coherent policy is the Conservative Party, and it just doesn't have one. As usual, they are failing to pick a lane on fiscal policy. Half of the time, the Conservatives like to talk about deficits and complain about government spending. But the other half of the time, like just now, they praise expensive billion dollar, multi-billion dollar programs put in place by the governments of other countries. So really, what is the fiscal policy? of the Conservative Party of Canada. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Smilkami Nicola. Mr. Speaker, despite having lower gas prices, the Americans have acted to help struggling families to fill their tanks and keep life affordable. This Prime Minister likes to import the divisive politics that occur to the south of our border and claims if we don't act firmly and rapidly, it will only get worse and be more difficult to counter. As our largest importer of American politics, when will our Prime Minister finally try to import something positive? Positive, like helping Canadians deal with gas prices. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, as the Honourable colleague knows, the current situation in Ukraine and the unprovoked attack by Russia has resulted in a geopolitical crisis in Europe and elevated energy prices around the world. While Canada's energy security remains intact, we are working with our international allies, very much with our friends in the United States, to stabilize energy markets around the world. In this regard, we have committed to increasing oil and gas production by 300,000 barrels per day by the end of the year. At home, we have instructed the Competition Bureau to ensure there is 
is no collusion uh, around gas pricing, and we are working to ensure that we are putting money back in the pockets of Canadians through the Canada Child Benefit, tax cuts for the middle class, and other items to ensure we are addressing the affordability. Honorable Deputy, the Honorable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker, this morning in my riding. The price of gas, gas went up to $2.24. I've never seen this before. And this is the reality affecting all Canadian families in my writing and across the country. And when prices go up, taxes go up as well. The government makes more money. However, what sets Canada apart from other countries, such as Germany, England, Australia, and other countries, is that they have lo lowered gas, gas taxes. How come the Liberal government is refusing to do so? The Honourable Minister of the Environment, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to continue in the same vein as my colleague with respect to carbon tax in 2007. Harper government suggested a $15 increase. Then they changed ideas in 2011 and said, no, that we won't do anything with respect to climate change. And then, surprise, during their last election campaign, the Conservative Party proposed once again to support carbon tax, and now they no longer support it. What the Canadians want is action on climate change, not flip-flopping every day. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, what Canadians want, Mr. Speaker, is clear. They want efficient policy to fight inflation. The government is filling its pockets with gas prices because taxes are rising and money is going out of Canadians' pockets. There are other countries are lowering such gas taxes. How come Canada can't do so? The Honourable Minister, rather Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, once again, we're seeing that the Conservatives have to pick a lane they need to pick a position. Half the time, they're talking about the deficit and they're complaining about the government's response. And the other half of the time, they're praising costly programs proposed by other governments elsewhere. So what are they really defending, the Conservatives? We need a responsible fiscal position. McMurray, Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, Canadians need answers, not talking points. People in my riding and in northern and rural communities all across Canada have to drive just about everywhere. Fuel prices are at record highs, which is making life harder for all Canadians. When will the government drop the talking points, do the right thing, and drop the GST on fuel and li make life more affordable for Canadians? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Colleague knows, the invasion, the unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia has driven up energy prices around the world. This government is working actively with our partners in the United States and with other countries around the world to ensure we are increasing supplies to stabilize energy pricing globally. We are also working actively within this country to ensure that we are addressing affordability challenges. This, uh, this opposition voted against tax cuts for the middle class. They voted against the Canada Child Benefit. They voted against daycare programs, all of which are aimed at ensuring the affordability for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. The Honourable Member for Carleton Trail Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' high taxes and high inflation policies are hurting Canadians. Sean, a veteran and a constituent in my riding, recently emailed me to say that as a result of the carbon tax and the impact of inflation, he has had to sell his home in order to get by. Sean's home was his nest egg and safety net for the future. But thanks to this Prime Minister's policies, it is gone. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge the harm his policies are having on Canadians like Sean? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is designed so that the majority of households in Canada receive more money from the climate incentive payment that they pay. This has been confirmed through the analysis of the Parliamentary Budget Officer, Mr. Speaker. As carbon prices increase, these payments also increase. For example, this year, a family of four will receive up to $745 in Ontario, $830, $830 in Manitoba, $1,100 in the members' province of Saskatchewan, Mr. Speaker, and more than $1,000 in Alberta. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
L'honorable. The Honorable Member for Avignon, La Matisse, Matan, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, it's official. 2021 is the most violent year in a decade for Montreal. The police have released their annual report and they're compiling over 25,000 crimes against people. Shootings doubled over the previous year. Mr. Speaker, at the heart of this wave of violence are organized crime groups and their illegal weapons. The federal government can't stop at restricting legal guns. It's the illegal guns that plague Montreal. Will the minister admit that C-21 does not solve this problem? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I agree entirely with my colleague. Shootings and tra tragedies related to gun violence are acceptable, unacceptable rather, and I'm pleased to work together with my bloc colleagues. But the question before the House now is Bill C-21. I'm impatient to start debate on this legislation because measures in this bill can better protect all communities and Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Matisse, Matin. Mr. Speaker, the freeze on legal handguns is a step forward, but in terms of illegal guns, let's face the reality. Members of crime don't buy their guns at the store. And they are the ones who made 2021 the most violent in Montreal. The minister can increase prison sentences, but we still need to be able to arrest these criminals and seize their illegal weapons. But the numbers show that we haven't done that by 2021. Organized cr crime is not worried. Does the minister realize that? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my colleague is very right. This bill is an, a significant step forward. Why? It introduces a national ban on handguns. Why? Because it introduces criminal sanctions for organized crime. Why? Because we can take the necessary steps to reduce intimate partner violence. These are concrete measures. We need this bill to protect all Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, we have to give police additional means to act. And one of these is the bloc's proposal to create a registry of criminal organizations. This would ease the burden of proof when police want to lay charges against organized criminals with 2021 being the most violent year in 10 years in Montreal, the minister no longer has the luxury of depriving the police of such a tool. Does the minister realize that this sad record forces him to take up our proposal to create a registry of criminal organizations? The Honourable Minister. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly the reason why we introduced our legislation, C-21. And as I already said, I'm always ready to work with my colleagues. I agree with the visions and ideas that they have put forth. But at the same time, we have to study this legislation. And it's really bad that the Conservatives has started disputes and uh, have delayed this debate. We have to move forward with this debate. We have to adopt this legislation as quickly as possible. Thank you. Well, member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, under this government, Canada is becoming less and less safe. The Liberals have brought in Bill C-5, legislation that is soft on gun crime, while the Supreme Court has ruled that you can drink your way out of a conviction for a serious crime and receive a discounted sentence for multiple murders. It's about time that the Liberals put victims first. Will this government provide a legislative response to these court rulings? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, our hearts go out to victims and we will always stand with victims. With respect to the Supreme Court ruling on serious intoxication, Mr. Speaker, we're looking carefully at that ruling. We, uh, the court has presented us with a, with a number of different options, and I have already said publicly that we will we will evaluate those options and come back and come back to this place, Mr. Speaker. Serious crimes in this country will always carry serious consequences. The failed tough on crime conservative policy needs to be put in the past, and that's precisely what we're doing. The honourable member for Fundy Royal, Mr. Speaker, this Supreme Court ruling means that the killer of three Mounties in Moncton, New Brunswick, has had his parole ineligibility reduced from 75 years 
to 25. This will put the victims' families through future misery. Will this government respond? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our hearts go out to anybody, to families and communities that suffer from uh, the ravages of, of multiple murders, Mr. Speaker. We, the, the Supreme Court ruling is clear, Mr. Speaker, and unanimous, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, we have said and we have pointed out that the, um, the ability of a mass murderer to get parole is extremely rare. Celebrated, celebrated murder, mass murders like Paul Ber Bernardo do not get parole, Mr. Speaker, and the system is in itself one that punishes criminals seriously. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, not all mandatory minimum sentences have been struck down by the Supreme right. Court of Canada. Bill C-5 punishes legitimate gun owners and gives violent criminals a ticket back to ruining more lives. In Surrey, two men, including one wanted on a Canada-wide warrant for human trafficking, have been charged after Mounties seized a loaded handgun in a traffic stop. Mr. Speaker, violent repeat offenders should be taken off the streets. Yes, yes, what does this government not understand about protecting victims and putting violent criminals behind bars? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if my colleague had read the bill, what she would see is that this initiative takes organized crime head on by raising maximum sentences against serious hardened criminals who would terrorize our communities. I was in my honourable colleague's province just last week to speak with Eileen Moore who lost her son some 15 years ago to gun violence. Unnecessary, harsh, needless, senseless violence. If my honourable colleague is interested in protecting her community, then she will vote for C21. It enjoys the support of survivors. It enjoys the support of women's groups. It enjoys the support of law enforcement. We should all unite behind this bill because that's how we'll protect Canadians, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. S Speaker, Surrey, B.C. has seen a troubling spike in gun violence with 20 Eight reports of shots fired and three confirmed deadly shootings by April of this year. Fatal gun violence by gangs linked to the drug trade continue to rise in my riding, putting our community in jeopardy. Yet this government chooses to play politics instead at the expense of people's lives. Shame. Why does Shame. the Prime Minister refuse to protect victims, often racialized and Indigenous Canadians, by the way, by, ans by ensuring repeat Violent offenders go to jail for their crimes. Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, what playing politics looks like in this chamber is in, rather than allowing for debate to commence on Bill C-21, stalling it, filibustering it, which is exactly what we saw last Friday and which we're pretty sure we're going to continue to see from Conservatives, Mr. Speaker. But notwithstanding that, we're going to continue to have this debate, Mr. Speaker. Can we continue? I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister to take it from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, what politics looks like in this chamber is when there's filibustering, which is exactly what the Conservatives engaged in last Friday when we were supposed to start debating Bill C-21. What we need to do, Mr. Speaker, is move forward with the national freeze on handguns. We need to move forward with the tools that will allow us to take organized crime and gun violence on, Mr. Speaker. And I'll tell you something, when you actually look at the Conservatives on this issue, they have no plan except for legalizing AR-15s and assault-style rifles, which would make our communities more dangerous. Our bill will protect communities. That's why they should vote for it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, security workers continue to bear the brunt of the chaos at our airports. In Vancouver on Friday, I met directly with airport workers who told me about missed breaks, excessive overtime and low wages. It's no wonder this government is having trouble filling positions. Now in Amsterdam, the public airport just reached a deal with the union that sees a pay raise during the busy summer travel season. But this government leaves workers at the whim of private contractors. Will the minister tell us is he concerned about the work conditions faced by our airport workers? Does he even care? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, of course our government is concerned about working conditions for all employees, including those who work for CATSA. 
we are also concerned about the experience of travelers. And my honorable colleague <coughs> mentions Amsterdam. Let me read this headline, Mr. Speaker. Amsterdam Airport boldly asked airlines to cancel flights to alleviate chaos. Mr. Speaker, we are witnessing a global phenomenon. And in order for us to serve the public properly, we need to increase resources, be there, working with the airlines, working with the airports, working with CATSA to ensure that we address these issues, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, it's been over 100 days since the illegal war in Ukraine, and this government still isn't transparent on sanctions imposed on Russian oligarchs. Global Affairs won't tell us what assets have been frozen because they say their data may not be complete. So the government doesn't know what's been sanctioned. Canadians don't know what's been sanctioned. Mr. Speaker, do the Russian oligarchs being sanctioned know what is being sanctioned? When will the finally plus the number and the amount of assets seized so Canadians can tell if the government's plan is actually working? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And one thing that has brought this House together over these last number of months is our solidarity in our support for Ukraine and our condemnation of the illegal invasion by Russia into Ukraine. And what we have also done is worked in an unprecedented fashion, bringing sanctions against Russia to level that playing field, to bring Russia down as we lift Ukraine up in this battle of their lives. Those sanctions are unprecedented. We've used since February February 24th, we have leveled sanctions at individuals, entities, over 1,400 of them, and we will continue to do that until the job is done. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, South Hesplow. Mr. Speaker, on April the 7th, our government put forward its plan to make life more affordable for Canadians through the 2022 budget. A top area of concern in my riding of Kitchener, South Hesplow, is the issue of housing affordability. We know that Canadians deserve a safe place to call home and that it should be affordable. Can the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance tell us what the government is doing to make the dream of owning a home a reality for more Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the Honourable Member, my colleague, for her question and for the very hard work that she is doing for her. to making housing more affordable for all Canadians. And that's why the budget included a tax-free first home savings account, a ban on foreign buyers for two years, a one-time payment of $500 to help people in need, $1.5 billion to support new housing co-ops, and a new $4 billion housing accelerator fund. I look forward to working with my colleague on these important projects. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Mr. Speaker, the government clearly does not know their own policies with respect to travel on federally regulated boats. Hmm. The Marine Atlantic policy clearly states that travel is open to unvaccinated Canadians because the voyage is less than 24 hours and it is essential. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, all plane trips in the world are less than 24 hours. And also, the Parliamentary Secretary's assertion that the hardy folks of Newfoundland will spend the entire voyage outside in the North Atlantic in their winter time is nothing short of ridiculous. <laughs> Canadians need a commitment that this government will put an end to their hypocritical and vindictive political mandates. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the hard work and the advocacy of my, the member opposite. As I said yesterday, it's a lot different traveling on a boat and on a plane when we're on, in an airplane, we're in a confined space, sitting right next to somebody, like we are here in the House of Commons. That's why we on this side wear masks. But when you're on a ferry, you can be far, far more socially distant. You can go outside. Windows are available. Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't recommend opening the window when you're up in the air. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the other thing we hear from the government is lots of statistics with respect to health care. 6,000 people, Mr. Speaker, die every month from heart disease. 3,500 people die from diabetes. 7,000 die monthly from cancer. 600 people die every month uh, from, from overdose, which is four times the amount pre-pandemic. Clearly, these numbers are meant simply for context. 
these diseases are a, re a reality in our lives, but Canadians do not live in fear. It's time for us to learn to live with COVID also. These mandates are clearly political science, not medical science. Isn't that right, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not a medical doctor like the uh, member opposite, but I would take note of the fact that he's just referred to a few deadly diseases. However, COVID-19 is one... I'm just going to interrupt for a moment there, so I... I'm sure, I'm sure the Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester wants to hear the answer, but we can't hear it if people are talking or shouting. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, I'm not a medical doctor like my colleague opposite, and we have been collaborating on the Health Committee. However, I don't think that just because Canadians die, unfortunately, from things like coronary artery disease, heart, like stroke and heart attacks, means that COVID-19 is less of a priority for this government. COVID-19 is beatable with vaccines and social distancing, wearing masks. We can beat COVID-19, but we need everybody in this House to participate. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. The Prime Minister and this government continue their hypocrisy and virtue signalling with their vindictive mandates as airports are in disarray, people are blocked from travelling and others remain unable to return to their jobs. We'll hear in their response that they're following the science, but let me offer a quote on the government's mandates from a well-known infectious disease specialist, Dr Isaac Bogosh. Quote, at the end of the day, the current pol policy probably isn't doing a whole lot. End quote. Their mandates aren't stopping the spread. They're not saving lives. They're hurting Canadians. When will the Prime Minister and this government end the mandates? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my, my colleague for his collaboration on the Health Committee as well. I was also there when we heard from Dr. Bogosh, who has been a consistent and sage advocate for vaccines from the first day of this pandemic, and he was this morning on the news as well. It is incontrovertible that vaccines will continue to save lives in this country. Only in the last month, Mr. Speaker, over 1,800 Canadians died from COVID-19. We cannot wish COVID-19 away. We must continue to be vigilant. We must continue to ensure that our neighbours are aware of where they can get a third and a fourth dose, and we must be wearing our masks when we're in public. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Well, I'd uh, encourage the Parliamentary Secretary to take a look. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes is trying to ask a question. And his own side is over, I'm not sure what they're doing. Let's keep it down and let's let the Honourable Member ask his question. The Honourable Member, please rise. Mr. Speaker, they're excited to tell the Parliamentary Secretary that he should offer that advice to the Prime Minister who's out uh, not wearing his mask when he's in enclosed spaces, but he has people wear them when he doesn't. So let's, now that we've heard political spin, let's hear from another infectious disease specialist, Dr. Neil Rao. Quote, the policy seems to lag the science and it's become incredibly political. End quote. It's well past the time for the Prime Minister and this government to accept that dividing Canadians and pitting neighbour against neighbour was wrong. People want their jobs back, they want to travel, they want to be able to visit with their families. Is the Prime Minister finally ready to drop the politics of stigmatization and division and end the mandates? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Dr. Neil Rao is renowned in my community as well. He's helped my mother, and when I was traveling a lot, he supported our team when we were traveling. He's a very good infectious disease doc, but I would posit that it's this side that's making this political. Vaccines aren't political. They're not controversial. These vaccine mandates have done a very good job, and of course, all of the regulations and all of the public health restrictions are constantly being reviewed, as they will be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, in Bill 96, Quebec made federally regulated businesses subject to the Charter of the French Language, but Federal Bill C-13, the Liberals' bill, contradicts Bill 96 by giving businesses a choice, therefore making French optional. And for the Quebec Community Group Network, offering a choice is already too much. They 
came yesterday to demand that the only the federal law would apply so that businesses can continue to operate in English only. Does the minister believe that her allies, like this Quebec Community Groups Network, care one iota about the decline of French in Quebec? The Honorable Minister of Official Languages. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, I've said it many, many times that we are recognize that there is a decline in French in Quebec, in, in Canada, including Quebec. That is why we have a bill that is ambitious uh, to ensure that we can do our fair share. The federal government wants to take its responsibilities seriously to ensure that we can do everything to address this situation because it's an absolute priority for this government. The Honorable Member for La Pointe de Lille, Mr. Speaker, English is not in danger in Quebec nor anywhere else on the planet. But that's what the English Montreal School Board believes, and they have announced that they will challenge Quebec's Bill 96. They have, in fact, called on all like-minded groups to come and help them fund this uh, challenge. My question to the minister is simple. Does she believe, like us, that English Montreal should not receive a single penny of taxpayers' funds to challenge Bill 96 in Quebec? The Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, once again, we've been very clear. Our government is the first federal party to recognize a decree of French in Quebec and in Canada. We have a bill to address the situation. But, Mr. Speaker, what's really disappointing is that yesterday in the Official Languages Committee, for the first hour of the committee, we saw a waste of time occur. Instead of taking the time needed to, to go through the bill and study it in depth. We saw the opposition banks, including the bloc, do everything they could to waste the time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Montmagnier, Lillet, Camarasca, Rivière de l'Eau. Mr. Speaker, the number of shootings in the Greater Montreal region is increasing. Fear is taking hold in the streets of some neighborhoods. Kids are traumatized by shootings in broad daylight. And what is the government doing to resolve this situation? With Bill C-5, well, it removes the mandatory prison sentences for robbery with a firearm, extortion with a firearm, trafficking in weapons. This is the world turned upside down, Mr. Speaker. How is this government so soft on criminals? The Honorable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, serious offenses will always have serious sentences. That what we're doing with C5, Mr. Speaker, is quite different. We are targeting the overrepresentation of black and indigenous peoples within the criminal justice system. We're not well, we are targeting offenses where public safety is not at in question. Mr. Speaker, for serious offenses, we have Bill C-21, and I hope that the opposition will support the two bills at once. The Honorable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker, I would invite the Minister of Justice to listen to this quote. While the federal government is using the overrepresentation of indigenous and peoples of diversity in our prisons to justify the abolition of many mandatory minimum sentences, it seems to forget one important fact, that the members of these same communities are equally overrepresented among the victims of these gun crimes. This quote comes from a statement by Muriel Chatelier, who is a member of the black community in Montreal. Would the prime minister like to discuss Bill C-5 with her, or does he think she also is racist? The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker. This uh, misinformation about Bill C-5 is very sad. We must remember that serious offenses will always have serious uh, sentences. Here, with Bill C-5, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about infractions where public safety is not in danger. So. We're giving a judge the flexibility to adapt a sentence in order to help society and victims as well. The Honorable Member for Arlebourg-Saint-Charles, when it comes from the Liberal benches, it's perfect. When it's from the opposition bench, it's misinformation. I'd like to know what the 
minister thinks about what the Quebec's Minister of Public Safety said when she announced her strategy to combat gun violence. She said, and I quote, I'm speaking to the criminals terrorizing our citizens. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you will find our police officers standing in your way. Minister Gibo wants to enforce the law. It should be strictly enforced without the petty politics the Prime Minister is so fond of. So if Mr. Gibo shares our position and the Prime Minister considers our position racist, does he think that Minister Gibo and the Quebec government are racist as well? Before we continue, I would remind the members that when they ask questions and speak, they refer to the person not by their name, but rather by their title, even if it's a quote. I apologize if even the speaker sometimes makes a mistake. The Honorable Minister, Mr. Speaker, I spoke a number of times with my counterpart, Minister Gibo, and we will continue to talk about Bill C-21. Minister Gibo announced his support for Bill C-21. He said it was a good step, a good a step in the right direction to protect Quebecers uh, and even other Canadians. We need to start the debate on this bill and ensure we can introduce measures to protect all Canadians. And I hope that the Conservatives will change direction now. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellin. Mr. Speaker, the Government of Canada is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40 per cent by 2030. Farmers are at the forefront of climate change, and their actions are critical to ensuring that Canada can achieve its climate goals. Can the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food tell the House about the latest initiatives put in place to help farmers reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for the question. You know the Canadian agricultural sector ha is an important partner in our fight against climate change, and that is why I recently announced over 47 projects across Canada for clean technologies with $15 million in funding. These projects will subsidize the purchasing costs of equipment that are energy efficient and other equipment that will help us to reduce our emissions and also invest in research and innovation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Allowed the Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to ethics violations, this Liberal government has already reached the super elite status. Whether it's billion dollar sweetheart deal with the We Charity or SNC Lavalin bullying, clam, scam, nepotism, or the $200,000 illegal vacation by the Prime Minister. It's as though these Liberals are competing who can see and be the most unethical. Now the International Trade Minister knew Amanda Alvaro was a close friend who ran her election campaign, and yet she awarded her a $17,000 contract anyway. When will the Minister quit blaming her own department officials and take ownership and responsibility for her own scandal? Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. This contract was proactively disclosed to the public over two years ago. I was not involved in the awarding of it. And this contract was reviewed by the civil service to ensure compliance with the rules. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister is being investigated by the Ethics Commissioner because she advanced the personal interests of her friend. Now we understand the Liberals need to pay a premium for spin doctors given all their scandals. But the <laughs> Minister for International Trade is being investigated because she gave a $17,000 sole source contract to a CBC pundit who is her dear personal friend and a former campaign organizer. Oh, this is ridiculous. Will the minister apologize for her unethical behavior and hand over all records on this contract to the Ethics Commissioner immediately? Uh, Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, all information related to this contract was disclosed proactively two years ago. I might remind the honourable member that at the height of this pandemic, it was critical to ensure that our small businesses and our workers know what was available to them. And you know what? I think our record speaks for itself. 5,000 jobs were saved.
Okay, the Honourable Minister from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, all of the information related to this contract was proactively disclosed over two years ago. Let's remember that at the height of this pandemic, it was really critical that small businesses and workers and Canadians understood what was available to them in support. Now, the record speaks for itself. Over 5,000 jobs were saved, 5 million jobs were saved as a result of the wage subsidy. And over 900,000 businesses got small business loans as a result of SEBA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Mr. Speaker, the contracting authority must not issue multiple contracts against a single requirement or back-to-back -back contracts to the same supplier in order to avoid obtaining the approval required by statute. These are Treasury Board contracting rules, yet the government has refused to address rampant splitting of contracts that benefit government insiders. An internal government document shows several hundred of these violations of the law. So will the President of the Treasury Board commit to the law or commit instead to Liberal insiders? Oh. Well, President of the Treasury Board. TBS contracts are issued in concordance with the government contracts regulations, Treasury Board's contracting policy guidelines and procedures. One of the fundamental principles of federal contracting is openness and providing suppliers with opportunities to submit bids for government contracts. When departments choose a non-competitive procurement strategy, it must be fully justified and recorded. From the perspective of value for money, the cost of awarding a contract outweighs any economic advantage associated with competing goods under $25,000 and services and construction contracts under $40,000. The Honourable Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. Mr. Speaker, in the 42nd Parliament, I introduced Bill C-374, an act to amend the Historic Sites and Monuments Act. This bill responded directly to Call to Action 79, to which uh, calls for the development of a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. It will also help to promote recognition and understanding of the history of Indigenous peoples, including their significant ongoing contributions to Canada. This ensures representation for Indigenous peoples on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change tell this House how we're advancing on Call to Action 79? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate my colleague from Cloverdale, Langley City, for the important work he did on advancing this very important issue. The Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada plays a central role in our country's official historic designations, ensuring representation for Indigenous peoples on the board is an important step in responding to Call to Action 79. Today, I introduce Bill C-23. The strong legislative framework, the first of its kind in Canada, will help ensure Canada's treasury treasured historic places are protected. The proposed legislation not only strengthens ind Indigenous voices at the table, but also provides flexibility to adapt and reuse historic places as sustainable ways of addressing climate, the climate change crisis. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, experts are clear that we won't control COVID until the world is vaccinated. Yet only 10% of people in low-income countries have received a vaccine, compared to 77% in high-income nations. The Liberals promised to send 200 million doses to COVAX, but fewer than 15 million have been delivered to date. Last year, the WHO said we stood on the brink of a catastrophic failure. Today, doctors of the border say we've fallen off the cliff. Why are the Liberals failing to deliver for Canadians and the world? Minister for International Development. Speaker, Canada has stepped up to vaccinate the world. In fact, actually, the 200 million doses that we have promised, we have actually been uh, delivering to, to multiple countries uh, uh, across the world. In fact, actually, tomorrow I have another meeting with uh, multiple nations uh, to discuss on the next test. This is also uh, a supply chain uh, issue as well. So we're making sure that we provide the appropriate uh, therapeutics, but we also need to make sure that the misinformation that's in our own country doesn't spread, that's preventing the acceptance of vaccines around the world as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow members of all parties have a chance to send Bill C-248, Ojibwe National Urban Park, to committee. It has the support of Windsor and, most importantly, Caldwell First Nations. It's their territory. Their voices need to be heard. 
Caldwell has waited for years for this park to become a reality, and Chief Duckworth has written every, a letter to every MP requesting that this bill move forward. But the government is putting up needless obstacles. Will the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations stand up for Caldwell First Nations, or will he side with petty politics and shut them out? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for his question. And in fact, I stood in this house to, to announce that we were moving ahead with this very project, here, here. Mr. Speaker. I would I would hope that he would be happy about that, as we are on this side of the house, Mr. Speaker. We have and we will continue to work with Indigenous people to build and co-manage national park in this country. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today's questions. Following discussions among representatives of all parties in the House, I understand that there is an agreement to observe a moment of silence in memory of the victims of the church attack in Nigeria. I ask our members to rise. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton-Griesbach is 